Juice World's mother, Carmela Wallace, joins us here in studio for her first interview on national television since her son's passing. Thank you so much for being here with us today. <laughs> Carmela, December 8th marked that two-year anniversary mm -hmm. of your, your baby's death. You would have been 23. Yeah. Is it hard not to think of where he would be, what he would be doing? Absolutely. You know, as a mom, you can't help it. You know, you can't help but wonder, you know, where his career would be, you know, where, where his life would be at this point. Um, in my head, I would say, you know, he, he wouldn't be struggling anymore with drugs. You know, he would have conquered that and just living his best life. So, yeah, you know, I have that picture in my head. Yeah. You know, I, um, since you said my picture in my head, because his music talks about how he pictured his life in his own head. And before I came down, um, I'm starting to show already emotional because I was listening to his music and I, and you, we're not the generation he was speaking no. to. He was speaking to those tens of thousands of kids around the world mm -hmm. who came to hear him, specifically hear him talk about his struggles. He didn't hide no. his mental health battles, his addiction battles. What made him so willing to share that? And why did it connect, do you think, in such a way? Well, in high school, he had therapy because he had impulsive behavior. So I had him see a psychologist. So he was used to communicating and really getting in touch with his feelings. What were you seeing at age 15? This documentary is absolutely brilliant. If you have a child, some person, in your young person in your life, you should really watch it because he does tap into the young people and the struggles they're experiencing today. Mm -hmm. But back then when he was 15, this kid in Chicago suburbs, what were you seeing that concerned you as a mom? Impulsiveness. You know, it was just um, that, that self-control um, that he just didn't have. And, and focus, like in school, he hated school. Mm -hmm. Very, very smart. But he just, he didn't like the idea of school. So it was always a struggle with him in school and, you know, skipping school, skipping classes. So I, I always had to have a plan for him. And then he found music at 19 or about 19. He released a song on SoundCloud and he really is credited with making this way of putting your own music out explode. So he becomes a meteoric star. Mm -hmm. At 19, in your mind, you were already worried. Yes, I was, I was worried. Now, I did not know at that time, before his music started coming out, that he was struggling like that. Sometimes it would seem like something was a little off, you know, something was a little different and not quite right, but I couldn't really put my hand on that he was actually using drugs. So even before he released his first hit, mm -hmm. he had started yes. using... Yes. What was he using? He was doing the lean, I believe, and, and he told me that he was taking, um, um, I think, Vicodin. He was taking one of a pill. So, so he, these he, were prescription... Yes. ...pills and medicine that he was self-medicating with? Yes. Where was he getting it from? I don't know. And, and then I don't know if it was something that, you know, he listened to a lot of music and heard that, that made him curious to even start experimenting. It just got in over his head. But, I, you know, I have no idea, you know, where he, where he would get it from or, you know, none of that. And you started to see some signs, but not clear enough. Correct. And you have been very close to him. You were a single mom. Mm -hmm. You raised him, to your point. You tried to put him in karate. <laughs> you were a hands-on mom, a single mom, holding it down. And this kid, who you were trying to get help, it seems, from everything that I've read and, and witnessed, just the world was going so fast. Yeah. And it was taking him in. Mm hmm And that's hard to watch as a parent because I felt like I couldn't protect him. You know, because, and when you think about it, you know, kids graduate from high school, the parents prepare mentally for them to go to college. So I allowed him to take a gap year 
just to, just to try it. I figured it wouldn't hurt. You know, give him a gap year. One of the conditions for him taking a gap year, he had to work. I think he worked it for about a month. It was like maybe a few weeks after he left that job that he really started getting busy in recognition for his music. But it just happened so fast. It's like one day he was gone, you know, so I didn't have time to prepare, you know, that he's not going to be here because he went from high school to Juice World. When he turned into Juice World, what was that like for you? Scary. You were scared. Because yeah. most parents, you think, oh my goodness, my son is now, he had a $3 million contract as a teenager. At 19. At 19, a $3 mm -hmm. million dollar contract. But his mom, you, were afraid. What were you afraid of? I couldn't protect him. From? Anything that wasn't good for him. You know, the drugs, the, the lifestyle. I just felt like um, I didn't know enough about the industry, and I, I just felt helpless because, like I said, I always had to have a plan for him. Mm -hmm. Like, with high school, you know, I had a relationship with one of the counselors where we would communicate about him, and he would, like, be my behind-the-scenes person to make sure Jared was doing what he needed to do. So, I, And that's been his life. I always had to have a plan for him. I didn't have a plan for this. His career takes off, and then as detailed in the documentary, the addiction mm -hmm. gets worse. Mm -hmm. I know one of the things that doesn't rest well with your soul is what you saw as enablers around him. Absolutely. Explain that to me. I just felt like his best interest wasn't being looked out for. I think people had their own agendas. I think they liked the lifestyle. And, and, and they were young, too, so I have to give them that. They're, they're young, so they don't see things the way, you know, we would see them. But I just think that he, he just didn't have the, the people in place that just tell him to stop or no, or he just didn't have that support system in place. Was he hiding it by then from you? He couldn't hide it because it was in his music. But we were at a point where we could talk about it. You know, he was, he was an adult. He wasn't living at home. But we still had that relationship where he felt comfortable talking about it. And, we, and I told him what my fears were, you know, of him overdosing. I encouraged him to speak with the psychologist he used to speak with because, you know, I arranged where they could have a mobile conversation. But he was 19 and he knew everything. You know, he figured he had it. And the people around him, some of them would reach out to me. What but not telling? the inner, inner circle, that they were scared. What I think is remarkable, Carmela, you see he's, he could be anyone's kid. Yeah. He is funny. Mm -hmm. He's loving. He happens, though, to be, at this time in his life, the biggest star mm -hmm. of his generation. And that was a lot of pressure for him, you know, mm -hmm. to... He didn't realize... I mean, he... And he said it in a documentary. He wanted it. But it's not what it seems. Yeah. It's not what you think. It came with a price. Ex that, exactly. You said um, that before his passing, he told you that he made the decision to get professional help. Mm -hmm. He did. Um, Was he ready to go to rehab? He sounded like it. And, and months before then, I say like in, in September, when I went to see him, he seemed like himself, you know, like my baby. Oh. He just, he, we just had such a good time hanging out. I, I brought him one of his favorite sandwiches from Chicago. So we were just, we were just hanging out and, you know, he wasn't doing the lean anymore. I could tell it was a difference in him that he, he wasn't doing the lean. I, I think he was still doing pills, but he told me he was ready to get help. Mm. And it, it was just, it was a special moment. You know, we just had that, we had that moment where I just knew he was going to overcome it. Um, and I know that you've, done yourself a lot of work to get to the point where you can do this interview. Yes. It's your first. And I struggle with taking you back to that day, but I do think, as you've shared, there's so many things that other parents can learn. You've told me that you were concerned about enablers around him. He's on a flight. Mm -hmm. It's right after his birthday. I remember the breaking news that he'd overdosed. And my nieces, his impact my nieces, I have a nephew, they all called me wow. sobbing. Wow. 
because they it was to them, that was their Kurt Cobain or Tupac from my generation. He meant something yeah. to them. And then the details came out. The amount of drugs in his body overwhelmed him. Mm -hmm. Who gave you that news? Who told you? My nephew. Um, he called me about 3, 3 a.m. And he told me that he had a seizure. He said, but he's okay. He's at the hospital. They're taking him to the hospital. So go to the hospital. And I just wanted to get to him. You know, I was just, I was just trying to get to him. And so we, we come in and then the, the guards are there and they're not let, letting me go right through. I didn't, they already knew what was going on. I didn't know. And I was just, I just wanted to get to him. I just wanted to see him. I just wanted to make sure he was okay. So once we get up there, um, they, they take us in another room and we're just sitting. And I, I just didn't really understand why we sit. I just needed to get to him. I needed to see if he was okay. And, and then the doctor came out and said he didn't make it. He said they tried to, you know, revive him. They tried using, you know, many things and it, and it just didn't, it didn't work. And I was just devastated that I just knew, okay, maybe this would be it. You know, maybe this would be his wake up call and, you know, he'll, he'll be okay. But it, it just never happened. I was never able to get to him you know, to make sure that he was okay. This is, his impact, I just, it's amazing. Um, his album that was released posthumously last month debuted number one. He's still speaking to these fans who are also struggling with anxiety and depression. And I know these stats mean nothing to you. You could care less, you want your son with you. You are, pairing his message to his music with a message to parents about addiction mm -hmm. and about mental health. What do you want to convey? I want to say, listen to your children and, and pay attention. You know, know what's popular in their culture. Because, you know, when we came up, people smoked. They smoked. They didn't, they didn't really pop pills. So I wasn't, I wasn't used to that, and I wasn't prepared for that. So I would just say, just have those open conversations and listen without judging. And, and sometimes it's hard, yeah. you know, because you want to step in and mom, you know, why are you doing this? But they're struggling, they're crying out, and they need someone that's going to listen to them that they could trust. No parent wants to hear that. But I believe in facing things head on. So I, I think they just need those conversations and take the judgment off. Take the And listen. And listen.